how did you become a Catholic? I know you were raised a Catholic, but at some point you said two and a half years ago, did you say? About, yeah, within yeah. the last so couple of years. That, what was that kind of reversion like? Yeah, you know, I was always raised Catholic. I loved being Catholic as a child. I loved my first communion. I loved confirmation in the eighth grade. It was such mm. a profound experience. I had really, mm. really profound experiences uh, with reconciliation in particular, especially during my high school years. Um, I went to a Catholic high school, so there's a pretty common retreat that other people may have taken called Kairos, yeah, which was a hugely profoundly experience for me. Oh. I later went back and led it as a senior in high school. Uh, by the time I got to college, I loved my faith, but I was just so constantly pulled in a zillion different directions that I wasn't as invested in it as I think I probably was in high school, constantly being surrounded by theology classes and mm -hmm. going to mass quite regularly at school. At the same time, while I was studying to become a physician and while I was engaging in this very important battle on my college campus for objective truth and for freedom of expression, there were a lot of people in the campus parish at the time who thought that was a really inappropriate way to be le leading a Catholic life, that we really weren't supposed to go out into the secular world. We were supposed mm -hmm. to stay pretty isolated with everything that we were doing. So most of the people on my campus were in ate Bible studies and they ate all of their meals at the church and they mm -hmm. did every single retreat that the church had to offer. And I thought that was really beautiful, but I felt this very different calling to go to everybody else who is not involved in that and try to bring them over there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's such a need for missionaries and a new sense in a new generational sense in America that's so beautifully needed in our society and is being fulfilled by many, many great organizations and great people. And I especially felt the need to do that online, which a lot of people think is crazy. But this is where culture is today. Our public square today in society isn't mm. a street corner. It's certainly not going to your parish every single weekend, especially since uh, a post-COVID world where mm. that's been incredibly wiped away. It's reaching people where they're at, and they just so happen to be on Instagram and TikTok. Um, I personally started exploring some Protestant denominations because of that, because I'd been told so many times I was a bad Catholic if I wasn't going every single day to daily mass because I had to study for a class, or if I was engaging in political stuff on my campus, I shouldn't be engaging in anything related to politics. I should only be engaging in the stuff happening in the parish. And that really turned me off originally. Um, so I ended up exploring some Protestant denominations, but I always felt very unfulfilled, mostly in the non-DOM world and the non-denominational world, because you go and it's this big rock concert and everybody's hands are up and it seems super friendly and welcoming. But every single time I left the service on Sunday morning, the message always felt like it was tailored exactly towards me. And you might think that would make you feel more fulfilled, like, oh, God really spoke to me in the message from this pastor. But I started to realize over time they were just keeping messages intentionally quite vague and trying to tie them to the biggest thing in pop culture so that every single person sitting in that audience walked away feeling like that was directed exactly towards me. That's so incredible. How would the pastor know that? Uh, and it really just equally applied to everybody. There was also this fundamental difference, I think, in the Protestant world that I was discovering that church was about you. Like you were the main character. You showed up and there was free coffee waiting for you. You showed up and there were donuts in the lobby waiting for you. You were supposed to text the pastor with this short, cute message to make sure that they were always telling you, oh, here's a thing to pray about today or whatever. And that seems really nice at the outset. But when you realize you're singing secular music, you're singing like pop music so that it sticks more in your brain with every passing day, you're hearing these intentionally vague messages and you're essentially going to a rock concert because that's what we do in culture, the Protestant church in America today has become quite Americanized, based on your assessment earlier, by catering everything towards culture and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And I felt myself longing for the roots of my own faith and how I was raised in the Catholic church, but also mm -hmm. the history and the story of us as Christians, that it's not about us, it's about God. And I love that Amen. about the mass. You show up and it's not about you. You're not picking the readings that day. You're not choosing what songs are sung by the choir. You're there to embrace the Eucharist. You are there to worship the God of all gods. You are there to be there to soak in everything that was established 2000 years ago, not for you, but because of our love for God and that mm. reversal of who is the main character, who is this really supposed to be about really helped me fall back in love with my faith. So did, were you growing in friendship with these other non-denominational folks? And how did they take it when you decided to go back to the Catholic Church? I was, yeah. So this carried on for several years after I graduated from college. I think COVID also played a huge role 
whole I was living in Arizona at the time and not a single parish was really offering the same experience in mass. And so I didn't really want to go because you couldn't touch anybody and you couldn't really get the Eucharist the same way. And you had to wear a mask the whole time. And it just felt very strange Mm -hmm. and not at all the faith that I was raised in. So it was a lot easier to just watch YouTube videos of church Mm -hmm. on your couch on Sunday morning. Right. And of course, the dog is barking and you're making your coffee and you're scrolling through Instagram the whole time. So it's not really the immersive experience Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be. Um, But ended up doing that a lot through COVID with some of my friends. And I actually was incredibly fortunate last September to take my first trip to the Holy Land. So I visited wow. Israel. Is it as wonderful as people say? People far, are always shocked. Far I've never more been. wonderful. Okay. Far more wonderful. I frankly, I would move there tomorrow. Like it, wow. it changed my entire perception really? of my faith. And we can get into all of yeah. that for sure. But I took my first trip there in September. I ended up going back eight weeks later to film a documentary about the city of Jerusalem. Mm. But like you say, this American version of Protestant Christianity doesn't really exist anywhere else. I've been incredibly fortunate to travel all over the world. I've been to 20 countries. Um, I'm going to New Zealand in a couple of weeks. So that's exciting. Oh, I'm going to Australia in a couple of weeks. There you go. We'll yeah, be neighbors yeah. again down there. Um, but everywhere that I visited, obviously, one of the most beautiful things about our faith is the universality of it with Catholic yeah. meaning universal. And I try to go to mass in every single other country that I can go to, because even if you don't speak German or mm-hmm. whatever language they're speaking in the country that you're in, you'll know what's happening in the service. I think that's so beautiful. So I decided I want to go to mass while we're here in Israel. This is the Holy Land everywhere I'm looking, there's Catholic churches where Jesus was born. There's a Catholic church where Mary was born. There's a Catholic church on the Mount of the Beatitudes. Uh, And when we were in Jerusalem, I looked up and there was a service open for everybody at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Mm -hmm. which is the pinnacle of our faith as all Christians. Uh, It's where Jesus was crucified, where he was buried in the tomb and where he was resurrected from the dead. And you walk into this church, having been to the Vatican, very profound experience. I love Rome. But there's this spiritual depth of this solemnness and honestly you just feel connected in this like straight line of history for 2000 years the moment you walk through the front door of the church of the holy sepulcher there is a stone on the ground that people are kneeling down to pray over and that's the stone where jesus's body was laid to be prepared for burial you go upstairs and you can touch the rock of golgotha with your own hands and just like having this Mm. sensory experience of where this all happened echoed throughout all of the holy land of course sailing on the sea of galilee and going to nazareth and experiencing these things to touch to smell to see brought my faith to life in a way that I never expected was even possible. You read about all these things in your Bible and it's amazing and it's beautiful and you love seeing it, but it's a totally different experience to be on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and have your tour guide say, okay, I'm putting my hand out right here and I'm putting my hand out right here. 70% of the gospels happened between my hands and your brain just like explodes because it's 10 miles long. How is that even possible? You think of the Holy Land as this massive outer worldly experience, uh, but it's really all a very small area that's real. It's colorful. It's joyful. And everywhere you go, there are Catholic churches everywhere. So I was on this trip with Turning Point USA. And most of the people on the trip uh, were Protestant Christians. Mm. Many were Jews. uh, And me and a handful of others, two or three other people, were Catholic. And I kept noticing everywhere we went, there's a Catholic church, there's Mm. a Catholic church, there's a Catholic church, which I expected. But a lot of people, shocking, I know, no (laughs) Southern Baptist rock concerts Mm. happening in Israel. Uh, A lot of people were turned off by that. They were frustrated by that. And it got the gears turning. The fact that it was a Catholic church Uh. and not a non-denominational, everybody's, Mm. everybody is welcome in our faith, but they don't necessarily Mm -hmm. see it that way. Uh, And it was fascinating, even in Capernaum, for example, they built a church right over Peter's house. So they have the foundation of Peter's home that's crumbling. It's very very, very old, 2,000 years, and they've built this church over it that looks kind of like a spaceship because they've had to preserve the original ruins where Uh. the floor is glass and you can look through. And the whole time we were in Capernaum, I'm sobbing my eyes out. There's a beautiful statue of Peter right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that says, upon this rock, I will build my church, Mm. this profound tangible experience that you are touching. And most of the people on my trip rolled their eyes and they're like, okay, can we get back in the bus now? Like this means nothing to me. And that broke my heart because how could that mean nothing to you where Jesus called his first apostles, where Jesus invited his ministry to start, where the head of the church, the very first head of the church lived, where his mother was healed by Christ himself. That means nothing to you. That's incredibly shocking to me. 
by the time we got to Jerusalem, decided to go to mass at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at seven, six or seven in the morning and brought along my fiance, who at the time had no interest in joining the Catholic Church. He was very vehemently against this idea mm. and our other Catholic friends. It was all in Latin. It was very beautiful, literally touching the empty tomb of Jesus. Mm. And to receive the Eucharist there, to sing in Latin there, to have this experience with people from all over the world uh, who did not speak the same languages, had nothing in common except for the beauty of our faith was easily the most profoundly moving mass that I've ever been to. Uh, after that, my fiance really started asking a lot of questions. And he said, you know, I didn't see one Protestant church with the exception of one the whole time that we were in the Holy Land. So that's getting me to ask a few different questions here. And that mass was really beautiful because it wasn't about me. I had no idea what was going on. I don't speak Latin. I don't really know the liturgy of the church. I don't really understand how this works quite yet, but I've never felt that much of a strong presence of God in my life whenever I've gone to church except in that experience. Um, our friend who was baptized Catholic but hadn't been confirmed yet also started asking a lot of the same questions. And it prompted me to have to do a whole bunch of research because he had questions for things that I'd never been asked to defend before. Well, don't you worship Mary? And how is it not cannibalism when you eat the Eucharist? And I don't understand how the saints work and what the heck is purgatory? And so I ordered probably a thousand dollars worth of books right after we got back from Israel the first time. I'm still working my way through them. But the more questions that he's had, the more questions I've had. And this I is think your friend or your fiance? My fiance, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, both. It's it both really, but I'm now serving as my fiance's sponsor nice. through RCIA. Oh, so wonderful. I even have more questions about all of this. And on our very first day of his class, our amazing deacon teaching the course reminded us of a St. Augustine quote, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the more faith I have, the more questions I have. And the mm. more my questions are answered, the more faith I have. And it's mm. this constant cycle of the intellectual side of Christianity that I think we've become really numb to in the West, in America. There is no intellect when you walk into a non-denominational church service. It's, okay, everybody, let's talk about this trending movie in movie theaters and how it might tie back to mm. one quote of scripture, and then we'll play you a rock song, and then there's some free coffee, and everybody leave. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I do want to push back because we have Protestants who are listening, and I know that there's a lot of Protestants who are very intellectually engaged and who go to churches that certainly don't Absolutely. just do wishy-washy feeling things. In my experience, in your, in yeah, my experience sure. it was very... Superficial. It was yeah. very surface level. It was very emotionally yeah. driven. There wasn't a whole lot going on intellectually. Um, and I have many, many very well educated Protestant mm -hmm. friends and love having great spiritual debates with them. But I just I wanted something more. I yeah. wanted the fullness of our faith. I wanted all of these deep questions to be answered for myself and so that I could help other people answer those questions. And it's just been the most beautiful journey falling back in love with how I was mm -hmm. raised. When I was exploring some other denominations, my dad said, Catholicism is the religion that you were raised with. It's how we raised you very intentionally, and I hope that you'll come back to this. But more mm. so, I hope that you'll come back to this because it's our heritage as Christians. Mm. And ultimately, that's the story of who we've been for the last 2,000 years. To be connected to the earliest church, mm. to be connected to Christ himself, is to embrace our heritage that way. Well, well, I want to tell you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive21.com slash matt. You go there right now, or if you text STRIVE to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, and it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it.